Hi, I'd like to um, give thanks to the creator and acknowledge the lands that I come in from, um, where I live, work, and have raised my family from the Yurikanji lands and from Gimoi, Wallabari, Yudinji. I acknowledge um, the country that you're all zooming in from today, um, the elders past and present um, and community, um, senior community leaders um, and the elders, uh, I beg your pardon, of the Gimui, Wallabari, Adinchi and Irukanji um, clans and adjacent um, traditional owner groups. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the first peoples that are on this uh, uh, webinar today um, on the panel and in attendance. My name is Rowena Bulio. I am the Senior Indigenous Facilitator with the Climate Systems Hub, NASP Climate Systems Hub. And uh, I've been I'm born and raised in Cairns that my people are from uh, the Wagadagam uh, clan of uh, Mabiok Island in the Torres Strait in the Western area and uh, Meriam people um, from the East. Um, thank you. So it's a, it's a pleasure um, having you all in attendance today. Um, this uh, this webinar, the purpose of it, um, and the format um, actually is a is a conversation type um, uh, Q and A format uh, that I've asked uh, my um, my colleagues, my panelists to participate in. Um, it can be a bit thought provoking, and it um, and it probably should be a bit uh, thought provoking because we live in a very um, uh, serious time or critical time in uh, not only in Australia uh, but but the world, um, uh, this earth that is uh, challenged by the um, global phenomena of, of climate change. And um, we also want to highlight uh, the opportunities of Indigenous engagement in the NESP and more broadly in the university uh, research and, and science um, sector and um, the opportunities and the risk. And it also, um, this webinar, we're hoping to also highlight um, those challenges also to Indigenous capabilities that are operating um, in this space and more broadly. Um, and I think Tani's um, put something on the, um, on the chat box. If people want to put some questions in, in the chat, please feel free as we go along, we'll have an opportunity um, at, um, uh, towards the end of the, um, of the webinar for questions and, and answers or responses. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to our panelists here today, and I'm very grateful for their uh, offering their time. They've been very gracious, and I, I will allow them to introduce themselves to you. Um, but as I said, in this, in this, it's not just pertaining to the climate systems or the or climate change, it is more broadly uh, because Indigenous people um, uh, live and have a worldview that is holistic um, in, in all aspects of their life, their livelihood. Um, so I just want to begin to um, introduce you first to um, Mandy uh, Downing, um, who is my um, counterpart in the Sustainable uh, Communities and Waste Research Hub. Um, she is the Indigenous facilitator there, and Mandy Hopkins, who I had the pleasure of, um, um, of working with Mandy previously, and we still continue to connect in this space. So um, I'm going to welcome first our first panelist. So let's just all have a cuppa and just relax and, and let's just see how it goes. And I think it'll be quite interesting today because we want to really, you know, make people think and uh, the challenges that we're operating in this space. And, and what is the big picture because of our shared history in this in this space. I, I just want to add that I did attend the UNFCCC forum in Cairns of the Standing Committee uh, members on nature-based solutions part two. And that was quite telling in that um, one of the big take home messages uh, was around um, engaging with local communities and indigenous communities more so and how to. So it's, um, it's this is a global sort of um, uh, challenge for, for everyone, particularly as we look at working in this multiple knowledge space. So welcome Mandy Downing. Um, uh, and thank you again uh, for um, agreeing to participate in this panel today. So I just wanna um, just ask you Mandy um, for 
uh, if you could give us a little bit of a background about yourself and um, uh, you're a proud Aboriginal woman uh, from uh, the Western Australia uh, side in the West so, and I'll just I'll let you begin to introduce yourself. Thank you. Mandy. Thanks Rowie. Um, so I, I guess I'd like to start by also acknowledging country and I'm speaking to you from Wajak Nuwabuja so I'd say Inala Kadij Wajak Nuwa Mot Kayan Kadij Nidij Mudij Buja, Inala Kadij Wajak Nuwa Wur Budia Kora Kora Wayye. And uh, Rowie, thank you very much for the acknowledgement to country as well. Um, I, as Rowie said, I'm Mandy Downing. I'm an Injibadi woman with maternal lineage to the Naluma Injibadi peoples of Roburn, uh, which is an area in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. Um, I'm perhaps known for being a little bit blunt and maybe this will clear that up for anyone who was not entirely clear. Um, more specifically, my country is around the Fortescue River in the Pilbara. Um, and until recently, it's the land that Fortescue Metals Group has raped for the last 17 years without our consent. I am the granddaughter and niece of stolen generation survivors. And ultimately, my fair skin is the result of eugenics policies under the 1905 Aborigines Act. The mission my grandfather and his sisters were taken to remained active until 1986. Consequently, I was not informed of my Aboriginality, given my fair skin, until my elders deemed it safe to do so in the late 80s. Uh, Work-wise, I wear quite a few different hats. So nationally, as Rowie said, I'm with the National Environmental Science Program, Sustainable Communities and Waste Research Hub as the Senior Indigenous Facilitator there. I also wear another hat as the co-chair of the IATSA, so the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies National Research Ethics Committee, which I've been a member on since 2019 and then appointed as the inaugural female co-chair when we restructured our governance system to align with gender roles in late 2021. At Curtin University, I'm the Dean of Indigenous Futures in the Faculty of Humanity. And I'm the first Aboriginal person to be appointed as a Dean within our faculty. I'm also a board member for Professor Stephen Van Leeuwen's uh, Australian Research Council Industrial Transformation Training Centre, Heal Country. Um, and uh, what I'm really passionate about is in community, I volunteer with the Western Australian Aboriginal Leadership Institute and have done so for the last four years. Uh, here I designed and continue to facilitate an emerging leadership program for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth aged 18 to 25 years. So albeit a very long day at the end of a work day, um, I spend the night in community with my young people. And um, it, it's really a highlight of my week. It's a snapshot of what our future looks like. And to me, it looks very bright. By way of qualifications, I'm an applied scientist in Indigenous Australian research and my Research interests are in the need uh, are about the need for anti-colonial research policy and looking at institutional racism, more specifically within the academy, so the university sector. Thanks, Mandy. I, I really appreciate you you sharing your history and your your background um, of your lived experience of your people, the the history. You know, um, growing up. Uh, in Cairns, I don't, I don't know if we were sheltered or, you know, we, I was, you know, raised with by my my granddad, my grandma, my paternal grandparents, my grandmother's sister, and there was eight of us in the family, and family would come and go uh, because the elders that came down from the Torres Strait at that time were very connected back to the homeland and back with the family. So it was, you know, uh, families were coming down for education or for health reasons and that sort of thing, and. And it wasn't um, until my, um, my, my granddad, we, we call up there from the Western side, um, when he passed away in 1999, that we were able to open up his port. You know, port is a, is a suitcase for those who are young people who don't know what port is. But um, so, and we weren't allowed to touch that, right? So, and then we, we came across his exemption paper and we came across, you know, he was a, a, a chief um, uh, head ganger and you know the railway you know because they came down after the pearling industry collapsed and 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 worked um you know on the 
um, on the cane farm, you know, which was started by the Chinese, um, the cane farmers and, um, and the railway, which are the big industries for, for our people coming down. But it wasn't until we actually realized when we saw his exemption paper, um, and my sister had done a, um, um, she, she graduated with um, honors with social work and she, she did her PhD on that, you know, so we, we didn't know about that. We had no idea that he had an exemption paper and then we started to reflect because we had that lived experience through him. You know, my granddad, we didn't understand that he wasn't allowed to um, talk to or associate with full blood Aboriginal people, you know, and we, we just didn't know that. Um, and we'd only seen his actions, you know, his, you know he's a Spanish Filipino uh, man, African as well, uh, West African, and he, uh, his grandparents had come through from the um, indentured laborers, you know, after the prohibition of, of slavery and that sort of thing. So it, it, I really wanted to just hone in on that because we do live a lived experience. We are sort of in this space operating, um, you know, grateful for the opportunity, absolutely. Um, operating in the space, and we do come uh, from this walk. And, um, you know, congratulations, uh, Dean Downing. I shall refer to you as Dean Downing through this for the sake of not causing any, you know, confusion with the two Mandys online. But uh, but thank you very much. I'll, I'll come back to you, and uh, I'll just go over to Mandy. Hi, Mandy. Thank you so much for um, agreeing to participate on today's webinar. Thank you. Hi, Rowie. Uh, Hi, thank you. Everyone both Mandy, uh, um, Dean Downing and Roe for your beautiful stories and well and acknowledgement to country. I'd also like to acknowledge the country that I'm coming in from today, the Bunurong country and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, I'm a, my back, my, uh, I'm non-Indigenous, Scottish, um, English descent, um, when I first started working with traditional owners in Australia, which was about seven years ago, I always heard the story about connecting to country. And I, I have felt a connection to country like no other, but not in Australia. Um, it, I live in Australia and I work in Australia and I love Australia as my home, born and bred in Australia. But when I went to Scotland, I felt a connection to country that made me realise what I was being told is that, you know, you'll know a connection to country when you feel it. I love Australia. I care for Australian country as well. But when I went to Scotland, I felt at home. And that made me um, really feel like I had a better understanding of our First Nations people can people's connection to country, which was humbling for me because you do hear about this connection and you, you know, if you're not, you're not sure to ask because it's a beautiful thing. Um, but for me to feel the connection in Scotland, I knew, I knew what I was feeling. So, um, so humbled to be a part of this panel. Um, my journey started I've done a lot of work in the Pacific over the last 15 years or so. Um, that's been wonderful, 14 countries and Timor-Leste. Um, we were asked in 2014, or we actually put in a bid in 2014 to lead the National Environmental Science Programs, the Systems and Climate Change Hub. And a part of that bid was to engage with Indigenous communities. Um, I, like Mandy Downing, am honest and frank about what I feel and think. So um, my first thought was we can't engage with Indigenous communities without a relationship, a connection, and no, a reason why we're going to do that. Um, and I felt that the request to engage with communities was a kind of tick-the-box exercise. and if we were to do that, we had to ask for extra time to think through how we were going to do it, who we were going to work with, how we were going to build strong connections and relationships, and what did climate change science actually mean for Indigenous communities? Because their knowledge of climate change is long and historic. 
So um, we set about undertaking a process to do that. I don't know if you want me to continue on that, Rowie, or? Oh, no, I think that's great, uh, Mandy. And, you know, and, and thank you for sharing your connection to country. Um, uh, I, I come from the Morrison clan from Aberdeen. We, we might be family, you know. We it's might a be. Day, Mandy. It's like <laughs> that. But it's, it's very important, you know, um, listening to you and, um, you know, you, you're sharing a non, you know, non-Indigenous person, but that you had worked in the, in the Pacific for some time um, under the former hub. Is that, is that correct? No, we, uh, I was 30 years in CSIRO. Right. Uh, in the last year, I, I, I left CSIRO on 4th of October, actually, so 12 months ago. Um, so the work was with the Pacific Climate Change Science Program and the Pacific Australian Adaptation Science Planning Program. So we, we undertook the first large climate change science program across the Pacific. Um, that was CSIRO, the Bureau, and the universities, which are CLECs now. Yeah, I might just ask you, yeah, thank you. I might just ask you, you know, in that sort of, um, um, in, in comparison, maybe, um, but, you know, coming on board and working now at the national level um, with the, with, in, in the, engage, uh, the engagement with Indigenous people, I, I understand that was the National Indigenous Dialogue on Climate Change. Yeah. Yoda Yoda Lands, Obama in 2018. Um, just quickly, I'll ask you and then I'll, I'll, I'll go to, to uh, Dean Downing around um, the, the opportunities um, and the risk um, having this first engagement um, in, 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 this, in this very area, because we all know that there's been pockets of research with, you know, universities or research hubs with, um, um, you know, First Nations communities around Australia, but this was the, the, the National Environmental Science Program. So can you just briefly just uh, share some of the opportunities and the risk that, um, that this had... Um, that, that uh, so the country. opportunities were great and still are great, as you know, Rowie. Um, you're continuing continuing that journey, and I know that it's it's going to get bigger and better as it goes along. So, mm -hmm. congratulations on that. Um, the I'm not sure we realised the opportunities as much as they were there when we first started. We did realise that there were challenges. Um, firstly, who did we talk to? We didn't have a relationship. So big challenge, um, you know, as we've learned, the lessons we've learned around free prior informed consent means that, you know, should we have even been signing a contract when we don't have, we haven't done that, that hasn't happened, you know, like um, we had signed the contract, we had taken on to do it, so how did we do it? Um, I had to then start researching pretty hard around what had been done in Australia in this space. Like lots of things had been done in Australia with communities from, you know, different research agencies and one, one community, but at a national level, how did you actually take that on? And, and you're never going to get it. It's not, it's not supposed to be, oh, we did it and this is the way you do it. It's nothing like that. It was how do you start to get that connection with communities across Australia? And so, and so, so how did you... How did you um, get into that space? So we knew that there had been a national climate change adaptation um, conference held on Yorta Yorta Country in 2012. And David Griggs, who was a colleague of ours in Monash University, had actually ran that um, workshop. And he was a member of NESP. So I went to him and said, you know, what do you think? Could we could you, could you introduce us to your, your colleagues at Yorta? Could we have a discussion around what we might do next? I also, um, I, I'm non-Indigenous, right? So <laughs> I can't do this. So I connected with Leah Talbot, who was in CSIRO, um, is a beautiful Indigenous woman from up where Rowie lives. And she helped us work through um, what we might do. And, and, and in the end, we agreed. It would just be a discussion first to find out where the lay of the land is, what was needed, was anything needed, 
if it was needed, what is it? Was it data? Was it just sharing stories? What was it? Um, and we went from there. Yeah, thanks, Mandy. I, I, and, and thank you for um, um, sharing. Uh, Leah Talbot is uh, Dr. Leah Talbot. She's a cookieology uh, woman, and, and, it's, and it's really important. I think there's a whole narrative out there, I think, around, um, well, we're, we're all humans. We should know how we all think and feel and, and respond and operate and all this, and that's all very well, but we're not all farmers or we're not all industry people. We're not all, you know, so you, you sort of got to look at those capabilities that, um, uh, that are going to, you know, help to sort of broker that engagement and continue on and build the trust, you know, and maintain that consistency. So you did mention, and I'm going to uh, speak to Dean Downey now. So um, Mandy uh, Hopkins, you, you mentioned about free pride informed consent and something that has been in the United uh, Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People and, and, um, and, and of course, uh, Indigenous cultural and intellectual property, which I very grateful for the uh, Australian government to include that into the into the nest contract the pause in the in the contract i mean that's a that's a big deal you know and i think people are still sort of coming around to really understanding that we all want to do sort of collaboration we want to do best practice and everything but when 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 those things are written into your clause you not only have to be seen to be doing it you're funded to do it but i'm just going to hand over to to mandy around uh, dean downing around these uh, these opportunities and and these risks um in this space operating you know you you know, in your in your other um, hats that you wear as co-chair of IAPSIS, as the senior Indigenous facilitator in our um, in in the in our partner hub, um, what are you? What do you see as the opportunities, and what are the risks or the or the challenges operating the spaces? You as a as 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 a person operating in the space, and more broadly for our people. Thank you. Thanks, Rowan and Mandy. Um... I think the opportunity is largely centre around having an opportunity to engage with us. Um, not everyone has that opportunity. I mean, when I first commenced with the score hub, um, I was very surprised to learn that we had members of the hub that had never had an interaction with an Aboriginal person before, which was a surprise to me. Um, but apparently that that is still a regular occurrence around the country. So it's something to be mindful of. Um, so that is an opportunity. It may very well be a first opportunity to engage with our people about this particular topic. The other thing is, uh, yes, I know we have westernised traditions around the academy and getting qualifications, but I don't know if you can necessarily compare those to a lifetime of cultural learning and knowledge. Um, we don't issue PhDs, I guess our elders are our professors. And that knowledge is very unique. There's a lot of it that is not written down. It's not available in a journal article, um, certainly not on open access. It is our, our research and our knowledge, it's, re it's relational, it's not transactional. So to be able to obtain such valuable information, um, that is really quite a unique opportunity. Um, with that, I guess some of the challenges are around respecting those knowledges and those relationships and building that trust with our people. Um, as an applied ethicist, I, as Linda Tahiwi Smith has put it, we as Indigenous people are the most over-researched population who receive the least benefit from research. So we're not overly trusting of researchers or science for that matter, because we have been doing things for years and years and years. And um, yeah, as far as bringing in uh, what I might refer to as, you know, Western ways of doing things and collecting knowledge and uh, validating what knowledge is deemed appropriate, um, we have our own ways of doing that. And sometimes I think there's a little bit of a a challenge in that itself. Um, so I guess some specific challenges around risks as well uh, for barriers to Indigenous knowledge in research might be ignorance of Indigenous knowledges alongside the fear of getting it wrong and maybe cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. Inflexible thinking within our 
systems and structures about what constitutes valid knowledge production, devaluing of unique, alternative or different ways of understanding and comprehending the world, and perhaps resistance to expanding our repertoire of academic approaches to understanding wisdom and creativity. I think another risk is uh, what I may have touched on already in my introduction is unethical partnerships. So mm. tell, you, tell me about that. Well, well, talk to me about that, please. Um, I mean, I it sort of stands to, you know, it's self-explanatory, but do, do you mind unpacking that, please? Sure. Um, I guess for me, obviously, I have very strong feelings about my people's country. So anyone who's done the wrong thing or any companies who have done the wrong thing by my country, I want nothing to do with them in any capacity. I, to me, I would rather sleep at night than, you know, take money from that group to conduct any type of research or uh, engage in any other activity. For me, I would rather have my cultural integrity and integrity as an Aboriginal woman than to lose that just through chasing research funding, for example. Yeah, I, look, look, I, I absolutely agree with you. You know, like when you mentioned before about um, uh, about the the um, the knowledge that doesn't and knowledge has become a commodity, right? Like it's a, it's it's a major commodity. Knowledge is, and um, uh, I'm I'm currently still um, an undergraduate with the James Cook University. The, looking at the I've, I've got about eight subjects left or something like that. You know, um, dual majoring in uh, Asia Pacific governance governance and development and anthropology. And outside of that, I have uh, my grade 12 certificate, you know, uh, but I have about 38 years um, of operating in this space or, or sitting with our old people. So every every job that I had gone into, which is really important, um, that I've consulted with my elders. When I went into child protection, I consulted with my elders because, you know, um, that was that was really um, important for me to share with them. Uh, because it was around the stolen generation and how would they feel, you know, that Rowe is now working in child safety. So I um, I uh, talked to my, uh, from Torres Strait and, and, you know, and especially for like our Aboriginal elders that helped me and um, and helped me grow here in, in the Cairns region. And and they shared, you know, their story and they said, you know, girl, what are you going to do in there, you know? And I, and I told her and she said, and they said, we you know, we understand um, it's important that we have our people in there. It's just very, you know, it brings back all these memories and all that, you know, sort of thing. So I'd, I'd update them every now and then. And um, and I had to talk to an elder because I actually didn't want this job, you know. Um, on scale, it just seemed a bit too big and it may have been out of my depth, you know. Um, and um, and I spoke to my elder in the Torres Strait and she said, well, Rowena, you know, it's up to you if you want to do this. It's 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 fine, you know, that's your decision after all. But how many Torres Strait Island women are in these positions? How many? You know, you've learned all this from your elders and you're going to say no, and you're in a position to help your people. So, you know, I just like that, you know, I, I rethought that very quickly and, um, and, and thanked her for it, you know, because we all come across challenges, but how do we go through it, you know, and, and how, what sort of support do we have for the for these roles, because it's around retention, right? You know, and and I was just I'm just going to ref, just reflect here to Mandy um, Hopkins. Mandy um, it was something that um, uh, Dean Downing just shared around uh, the fear of getting it wrong. So you know, I I admit I get it wrong all the time. You know, so I get I, I get a serving from my mob all the time. So you know, it's it's like you just got to like you know, how do you build resilience if you're just going to pack your bags and go home or, you know, like, oh, gosh. So how, how, how did you, you know, as a non-Indigenous person coming into the space, because it's a big deal, because where we're at now, how I'm seeing with the traditional owners around the negative impacts of climate change on countries that this is their livelihood, this is their future generation, you know, this is, it's a big deal. So they're sort of at this you know, for some of them, they're at this at the cusp of sharing their knowledge, but we've got to get it right. You know, so have have you come across? You could you share a little bit about some of your experience when there was this, like, you know, when you've had to make decisions? Because I understood that you, you know, you had a pretty, um, you know, uh, sort of big position 
uh, how do you say, you know, in, in the NEST formally, um, the former Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub, because that's a big thing about the fear of getting it wrong, right? You know, and then, you know, and and where, where do we go from there? Because I know that I, I as an Indigenous facilitator, I, I usually get the brunt of it from our mob, you know, and that's, you know, it's, it ain't, it ain't a picnic in the park, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, so so can you can you share? Because a lot of our our scientists now in, in the hub and more generally in the NESP, you know, we're coming into this space. And uh, and I think your learning would be really, you know, what you're if you're able to share, maybe, or just from experiences or I think um the not getting it wrong thing is a really good point, Mandy. Um because, you know, for my generation at least, we weren't brought up with the understanding of what happened during colonisation. And so for myself and for to, part, to be respectful to the people I was going to work with, I did a lot of learning around that. So I, I knew, I, I knew um, what history had been so that I... Just, just because I felt that was the right thing to do. So I think that is one a challenge. If people don't understand um, the historic, you know, um, things that have happened since through colonisation, they don't get a full picture of why people may feel the way they feel. And I think it is important for each and every person to understand protocols and, and cultural safety, not just... You know, we've talked about this a lot, Rowie, about we're not just talking about cultural protocols and cultural safety for the sake of well, what we are, but just for traditional owners. We're talking about it across the board for everybody so that we all feel safe and we all feel together. So I think that's important. Challenges were there is still big, big um Bridge, or bridges to be built, maybe not big, bridges to be built between research and communities. And I think um, an example of, you know, um, Ma um, Mandy speaking before about the Pilbara and things that have happened up there, st things still happen with no consent, no discussion, no. And so, you know, if you're really trying to do this in the way that um, is respectful and you want to build relationships and you want something to um, to be joint, then you need to walk the walk and talk the talk. You can't do one or the other. You've got to do both. And so once we started having conversations with Yorta Yorta and, you know, we got some frank, frank and fearless advice from, from the mob when we first had the National Indigenous Dialogue on Climate Change. And it really set us up for a strong place. We knew that there were other, you know, we, we were asked by our research agencies or organisations to have ethics approval. But ethic approval is it? Is it the National Health Medical Research ethic approval because you're a research agency or is it an ethics approval that you've all come together and agreed on. Well, for us, it wasn't an ethics approval that we'd all come together and agreed on. We were asking people to sign forms of consent, but they'd come from Cairns on an error. So they, they were there, they had consented. You know, we had to do a whole big think about what does this actually mean and how are we going to take it forward? And which is when you, Rowie, my beautiful friend, came on board and we started to really, Rowie and I have had some really robust discussions around how does this work if we're doing Indigenous-led co-design. And as Rowie said, for us, for, for me as a non-Indigenous person, but in my organisation who expects me to do this and that and that and this, I feel the, the buffer, you know, I've got to be the buffer as well because I'm pushing back on the ethics. And I'm pushing back on this and I'm pushing back on that because that's not going to work for if we truly want a, a respectful, trusted relationship. Yeah, fair dinkum. Like, Dean Downing, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Because it, it is an area that you're, you, that you're an expert in. Or... Yeah, 
Um, yeah, I guess in regards to all things ethics, um, so under the IATS Code of Ethics, we demand to see evidence of engagement with community. Um, so we talk about free and prior informed consent and ordinarily as researchers, we think about consent as being you get consent from your participant, you hand over an information sheet uh, and you'll still need to do that. But we also want to see that there is genuine support about your research project from around relevant organisations, uh, Aboriginal control, community controlled organisations, uh, communities, uh, whether it's the um, prescribed body corporate, whoever is the relevant local body who can give support for the project. Um, so it takes a lot longer. Um, and I do hear this a lot from a lot of non-Indigenous researchers about how much of an inconvenience it is and how long it's going to take. And um, the usual response is, too bad, so sad. This is what we have to do. If we get it wrong, we get people not turning up on our doorstep and we cop it. So um, if it's good enough for us, well, it's good enough for non-Indigenous people to be doing the work as well. And yes, you're not going to get an ethics approval as fast as a uh, research project which has no Indigenous engagement or Indigenous activity. Um, that's fine. If you like, prefer to do the quick, short and sweet transactional based research, go out and do that. Uh, we don't need people doing research about us. Um, we need good research done well. So mm -hmm. if you're willing to invest and you're willing to, like you said, Mandy, walk the talk, then by all means, come on board. But it does come back to Indigenous priority setting. If you want us to be fully engaged in a project, um, again, IATS's Code of Ethics talks about self-determination as being one of our principles and Indigenous leadership as being another ethical principle. So if you want to be doing research with us, ask us what you want, what we want as an outcome, what our priorities are, and then start to build a project with us. I can't stand the term co-design. Um, I, I like it. <laughs> but I know, is, is, is it one of those buzzwords that come, you know, like... Well, I, I see it, uh, I'm on the receiving end of seeing people presenting it as a research methodology or method. Sure, sure. And it's not validated as a method. Yeah, sure. It's not. It is something that I think has emerged from government processes to make us all feel a bit better about the world. Um, I think what we're genuinely looking for in research is when we talk about co-design, it's more around participatory action-based research. So that is going along for the ride from project design uh, all the way through to communication of finding results. We are there. We play a role in every factor of the project. And that's yeah, okay. what we promote through IATS's Code of Ethics as well. Yeah, right, yeah. right. That's good clarification, yeah. Mandy, because that is what we're talking about, more participatory than... I mean, I suppose code design speaks more to the design of a project rather than what that, that participatory approach, but definitely what we or what we have done was participatory and what we try to do in the future will be exactly the same no matter where I work or who I work with if I'm working and let, let's face it if you're working in Australia you are working on traditional land somewhere so a conversation should always be had about this is what we're doing you might not you might not want to be involved but know we're doing it and if you'd like information we'll share it and if you'd like to be involved you're more than welcome um, and let's talk about what what that involvement is and what what it entails and I also really really agree with your point around it takes as long as it takes um, it's not about we have to have a milestone on this date and we've got a budget with this and we've got to do that I mean it is on on the non-Indigenous side, but it, it's in Australia the same as in the Pacific, the same in Southeast in Southeast Asia where I've worked. It, it's not about that. It's about it takes as long as it takes. Other things that come into the priorities. So setting up to finish something on the 23rd of December 2024 probably isn't going to always work. You know, things happen. And they even happen, they happen for all of us, so accept that. And also remember that um, 
you know, people's time is precious. So make sure you, they understand the time. If there, if there is remuneration required for that time, make sure the remuneration is in, available. You know, we all get paid to do what we're doing. So every one of us should get paid to do what we're doing. And I also try to ensure that if I'm working on a project that's going to have deep Indigenous engagement, I have a budget to employ an Indigenous person into the team. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Look, um, Mandy, when you when you shared uh, Mandy Hopkins, when, when you shared around um, because we we all grew up in that time where we, where we didn't know about the history of this country and 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 a lot of you know and you sort of find out when you go to university, you know, uh, previously, you know, today it's a lot more and that conversation, the discourse is is out there, you know, around um, our shared history and that. But I do just want to quickly add and we'll we'll move on around um Dean Downing you know you sharing around um the IATSIS uh, you know code of ethics and and ethics application and, and and no one university because this is me not not knowing you know uh, my, my limited knowledge in this area around ethics application so no one university has the same I know it's very sort of you know it's robust and it's you know you've got to but but no one university is is the same, and and I heard you say uh, you've got to have demonstrated uh, when you're doing it through the uh, access ethics application that you have got to have demonstrated that you have been um, sitting, talking with, listening to, um, engaging with uh, First Nations people. Um, that you would have to have some runs on the board to demonstrate this is the sort of the project, you know, inception uh, that we have been, you know, working with and engaging with Indigenous people. Yeah, um, every university ethics committee, obviously, we have the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Human Research, which tells us how we have to constitute an ethics committee, and they have their own set of guidelines. Um, and the nature of ethics is it's very much open to interpretation. So how individuals choose to interpret it is up to them. Um, obviously, I interpret it one way and maybe completely different to others. and I'm certain of that, given a lot of the conversations I've been involved in. Um, so there is actually a section in that national statement, uh, which every ethics committee in Australia should be complying with around human research under chapter 4.7, uh, which is does state that you need to have Indigenous governance. It does state that you need to engage and show evidence of engagement. It also refers back to the IATSIS code of ethics, so no one should be avoiding it. Um, it has been around for a long time. The revised version was released in October 2020. Um, so this is not new. Uh, it was released sometime in the 90s. And I don't have my notes right in front of me, but I can confirm that it was. Um, so this is not new information. Yet for some reason, people are choosing not to do the work, possibly because it's a bit challenging. Uh, it does make it increasingly difficult when there is no requirement under the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Human Research, so through the National Health and Medical Research Council, to have an Aboriginal person on that ethics committee. Under section 5.1.30, it is optional. You can have a person with a pastoral care background or an Aboriginal elder. Mm -hmm. And I can confirm that based on data from, I think, 2018, uh, the last count was only 26% of committees chose to have an Indigenous person on their committee membership. So the nature of non-Indigenous people reviewing Indigenous research and then telling us whether or not it's culturally competent, uh, as an Indigenous person, an ind Indigenous researcher, it's challenging. Um, there are committees like IATSIS who are fee for service, so you can apply to them. However, if you're with an institution, you should be able to go to that institutional ethics committee and have a robust review there. Um, yeah, great. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that. That's um, I really, well, sorry, I really appreciate um, that bit of insight into um, into this area around around ethics because of the um, you know the clause that we do have now around ICIP and pre and informed consent and how we are doing business and what sort of support. Um, do Indigenous facilitators have? 
um, you know, in this space and we, we have each other. Um, so I'm just going to just, uh, before we go into questions, I do want to sort of make mention of the, um, that unfortunately we couldn't have um, someone from the Torres Strait, even though I am from the Torres Strait, um, it's, uh, um, it's, it's best to have someone from the Torres Strait to talk um, on matters up there because of, um, you know, what, what has happened and has taken place at the UN with the Torres Strait 8. And um, uh, my, my connections are also with the Kulkalgal nations um, in, the, in the Central Islands. And um, we had been, um, you know, lobbying uh, the government previously, you know, in 1992, 93, about, um, you know, the Australian government doing um, doing more in our backyard in the Torres Strait, whether it's happening in real time. And, and the, you know, and it's great, you know, of course, you know, in the Pacific where, where these things, uh, climate change, sea level rise are, are very, you know, um, it's, it's just profound. So I, I do just want to acknowledge, um, you know, Torres Strait, um, and not only do we, you know, have those issues around climate change, but we, um, you know, sit next to, we're, we're at the international border where we have, you know, um, our people on the ground, um, you know, navigate um, international relations and foreign policy as well. But I mean, you know, that's, that's something else. But I just wanted to just highlight the dynamics and the dimensions around this. It is, it is so huge on the ground what our people are doing, um, you know, to... Um, to get through. And, and I think that there's um, great um, investment from the Australian government. I think there's a whole lot of great things that we're doing um, at the moment to, you know, progress the area with the National First Peoples Platform on Climate Change. We're having the uh, inaugural meeting at the late, uh, in late October. We've got, um, uh, we have project under uh, the overarching understanding and connecting uh, parallel climate knowledge through Western of Western systems and ancient law, which is which is a really good uh, one that um, uh, that people have um, our people have come to understand and have you know and and um, invested their time and and their engagement in as well um, as the scientists. But I think we will go to questions, perhaps um, Tani, if there are any questions. And who are they directed to, individuals or the panel? There are a couple of questions, Rowie. I can see them, so I'm happy to read them. Yes, please. Well, there's a couple from Simon. Um, Simon Marsland. Uh, so too many, too many questions. So here are some to pick from. Uh, so uh, Simon asks, should NESP have an Indigenous focused hub or is the effort and funds better dispersed across all hubs or perhaps both? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Simon. I mean, you know, there's been some, you know, discussions um, uh, uh, in this space uh, for one. I mean, uh, from me personally, um, I think that uh, there needs to be additional support um, uh, for Indigenous facilitators. Um, you know, we, we have each other and we have the, um, um, the, the Indigenous facilitation network and the knowledge brokers, the Indigenous capabilities in NEST, in the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment, water, no, something DQ, um, but but I think that in terms of um, like me personally, it's been a really great um, uh, breadth of experience getting to know scientists, getting to work with them. It has been that has been like um, a really truly um, uh, you know a, a journey that I I don't think I may have had if it was. Possibly, I, I don't know, but this is this is a, a great opportunity uh, to get to know scientists and to work with them, um, and and understand them, and you know, and and operating in this multiple knowledge systems, and then and the scientists wanting to know more about how to do business. So you know, I think that's one that is 
is being had, that conversation, Mandy Downing, is that? Um, I tend to agree. I wouldn't want to see a standalone Indigenous hub. Um, what we're trying to achieve through this is working together. Yeah. Um, if we think around things to do with what's going on in the direction of the country, you know, we're trying to establish a voice to Parliament, etc. Um, if we separate, then how is that advancing us in that direction? And I think it is a good opportunity for people to be, for lack of better words, forced to engage with us within the hub. So uh, both Rowie and I being in two separate hubs, obviously we come together for cross hub meetings and so forth. And yes, there's only a few of us and it's tough when you're the only one also speaking in one hub. Um, but when we can come together, I think that's really quite a good opportunity to also see some of the diversity of Indigenous Australia and what that then means for uh, what we're encountering in this space. Great answers, ladies. And as a non-Indigenous person, I would agree. I think that the approach that we're taking is participatory, as we're saying, even though I believe we need more Indigenous um, people on board, as Mandy said. Um, and I'm sure we'll get to that. Or I, I hope very much that we'll get to that. I believe um, in, the, in the same principles of, as you've just said. Uh, the next question is listening and enjoying the discussions from Glenda. Um, the theme today is around climate change and would like to hear about how to balance best practice and also respond in a timely way to that challenge and respect the true and necessary requirements of participatory projects. So, uh, Glenda, I'm happy to talk a little bit about where we got to. Um, with the National Climate Change uh, Dialogue. We held a dialogue in 2018, which kicked off our thinking around climate change. The discussion was to uh, work through the questions that I mentioned at the start of the, the, uh, the workshop, and that was what information, if any, was required by um, Indigenous communities around climate change, the use of climate change science and information, um, climate change adaptation, and any, any thoughts around um, using climate change mitigation options for um, economic growth for communities. Um, where, where we got to in the first dialogue was that we had 70 traditional owners from around Australia there. Um, as Mandy said before, they had all um, had sign off by their corporations to be there. Um, and they we come out of that with some recommendations around furthering the discussion with climate scientists so that there was a participatory, participatory approach in projects, that there was a very, very diverse um, diverse not, uh, learning for us as um, researchers to, to that some people, some communities were ready to use GIS mapping, had data layers of their country, and other people were still trying to understand why the um, catapult pillars weren't coming out in the winter months because of the ch seasonal change. So very diverse knowledge on country of climate change and how you might, not climate change itself, but the science or the information, the data around how you might use it. So we took that information and tried to start to think about some projects that could bring um, teams together that would discuss some of those things, water management. Um, water, so water was one, both the extreme dries and the extreme wets sea level rise, uh, tropical cyclones, et cetera, et cetera. Rowie has her hand up so she can um, comment a little bit more about. Oh, no, I think that's fine, you know, um, Mandy. And, um, and and there's some, I think there's a few questions um, here. And, and thank you, Glenda, for asking that, that question for Simon. Um, there's one from John um, Rich, Richardson, uh, Red Cross. 
uh, picking up on Mandy's point about the importance of being able to talk with someone internally to help lead with engagement with Indigenous peoples, what would you recommend where an organisation may not have Indigenous people on staff or in their board, et cetera, to help that engagement? Um, uh, probably, you know, identifying that you, you, you've you identified the need and you may need to um, get a capability in, inside. Um, your organisation, I think. <clears throat> I think John and and others um, also at the UNFCCC, um, another group which we went out on the session on on the breakout sessions, came back and delivered and said that, uh, and this is what they're noticing on a global scale, <clears throat> is that the capabilities that they do have, uh, indigenous capabilities, and people that are locally. Uh, from local communities, Indigenous communities, the, the capabilities, uh, there's, they, they don't last long because they're burnt out. Um, so, you know, that was quite telling for me. I didn't sit in that group, but that's something that I've been talking. Yeah, Mandy, Ma Dean Downing. Thanks, Rory. I was just going to say, yeah, the burnout thing is very real. Um, I have been described as a unicorn. There's not a huge number of Aboriginal female scientists around the country. Uh, so when someone needs a particular voice on a committee, we I've got three more requests waiting that I have to say no to this week. Um, it, it's ongoing. And um, thankfully, I don't seem to need to sleep a huge amount. But it is really, really exhausting the amount of demand that we're looking at. Um, I, I think to answer the question, um, firstly, I'd be looking internally as to why don't you have any Indigenous staff or Indigenous people on your boards and perhaps to be having a conversation with your people and culture or human resources area about how can you change that and what can you do about it. Um, there may be a number of different reasons. Uh, if you can't, there are organisations around. I mean, I'm part of an alumni of a few hundred Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women um, who have completed leadership training through the Western Australian Leadership Institute. So we frequently receive queries about, have you got anyone to sit on a board? And if we don't, we send it out through all our, our contacts around the country to find out who might be interested. Um, also, engage. There's nothing stopping people from going out to prescribe bodies corporate if they're in the relevant lo geographic location and having a conversation. You don't need an Indigenous person to take you out and do that. You can do it yourself and you probably get more respect for doing it yourself and starting to have those conversations. If you build trust there and people realise you're walking the talk, they'll respect you and they will find ways to work with you and support you. That's wonderful. And, you know, like this, this is, this has been a sort of, a, you know, like a conversation and it has been raw, you know, and, um, and it may have been that we identified the barriers and the risk and, um, you know, we're still plugging along and there's some great work that we're doing, you know, we want to sort of just make mention that there's been this beautiful engagement that's happening at the moment um, across all the hubs um, and and in general in in research um, and universities across the board with traditional owners. Um, do we, we also want to be real about about the space that we're operating in as well. So we don't want to sort of just paint a picture to say that we have you know, the benefits are great because there is some heavy lifting on the ground because Mandy had said before about Dean Downing had mentioned about the trust. Um, and so when I go out, when Mandy Downing goes out, they they look at us and we are we are the hub or we are the nest or we are, you know, so um, things that happen may get problematic, but we go back to the table and we talk. So so there, there's a lot of heavy lifting and there's some good good work we're doing with the World Heritage um, Area, a couple of World Heritage Areas. There's some great science that's happening over there, some great collaboration and co-design co or particip participatory action research. Um, and, um, and in you know, areas of the Cape and in the Northern Territory. Um, but we, do, we, we did want to highlight that, that there are, you know, there are these tension points as well that um, you know, together, and we can only do this together from what Dean Downey um, had said before, that we need, to, we need to stick together, we need to work together, we need to be open, we need to be courageous, you know, we need to listen to each other. 
Um, and I think the NEST principles, you know, have uh, have set it all out as well, you know, and it's just unpacking that and how we do business on the ground with our First Nations people. We've hit one o'clock, everyone. Thank you very much to Dean Downing and Mandy Hopkins. Thank you, Tani. Thank you all for your attendance today. We really appreciate your time. All the best. Bye.